everyone, it's Jennifer Shahadi, and I am here with Jennifer Yu, who's going to show you a little segment of her class on how to win terrible positions. Hey, Jen. Hi, how are you doing? So how do we win terrible positions? Well, I think the most important thing is, um, like there's this saying, famous saying in chess, that the hardest thing to do is win and win one position. So when you're in the opposite side you you just want to challenge your opponent constantly so i think the mo the best way to challenge them is just to attack them like recklessly a lot because you're already losing a lot of the time it's just like uh if my position is already bad i might as well just go all in so i love it yeah <laughs> um so i have a game from the olympia and where i was playing a strong woman grandmaster where was this olympia jen this was in Georgia, the country. In Georgia, is that the one that were you, because I know you got a medal at a recent Olympiad. Was that the one where you got the bronze medal? Yeah, yeah, this was. Um, and I think this game was actually a turning point for me personally in the tournament, because um, I was completely losing this game. And then uh, after I won this game, it, we kind of like um, secured our match for, for that, because um, we weren't sure if we were going to win the match before, I think. But, um, and then, for me personally, like I also got a norm this tournament, which I don't think would have been possible if I didn't win this one. So it was kind of an important game and it was a really um, topsy turvy one. Did you get an, you got an IM norm and a WGM norm, is that correct? Yeah. Awesome, great. Well, you can uh, share your screen with us if you wanna. Yeah, so basically what happened um, in this game was, uh, my opponent is, uh, I'm not exactly sure if she's an IM or WGM. I think she's an IM, but she's a pretty strong player, and she completely outplayed me this game. Like, she played a really beautiful game up to this point. And in this position, I'm just dead lost. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no other thing to say. I'm just completely lost here. Um, I'm losing a lot. Uh, like, I can't really take on, I mean, it's her move, right? So I think she played bishop e4 here. And here, um, okay, I'm going to get rid of some of these errors. Yeah. So I... I just, I, there's not much I can do here. Like white is completely dominating in this position and all of my pieces are terrible. This bishop is kind of just like a pawn at this point. And I can't even take on here, I take on G6 because um, it, it opens up this and all of a sudden I lose the bishop. So here I just had to take a moment and I was like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here. Like it's almost a resignable position because there's, I'm losing this pawn oops, as well, the C6 pawn. And um, I just didn't know what to do, but I couldn't really resign here because one, um, I'm also playing for the team, not just for myself. And like, personally, I just always like to fight till the very end. So what I wanted to do was just to like try to make it as complicated for her as possible. So the one thing that I can do to try to complicate the position is I have my pieces out here and this little weakness here. So I was just like, what if I can just try to attack her somehow just to make it complicated and maybe she'll make a mistake. So I guess this is kind of like the art of swindling. Some people like to call it. You just want to start making threats that even if they don't mean much, if it gives your opponent a chance to make a mistake, then it's kind of worth it. So here I decided, so I thought for a little while, because we were also after time control. So I couldn't really play with um, putting her in time pressure. But I thought for a while, and I just really, really confidently played f6, g6. So normally it would just be like, oh, I'm just hanging this bishop here. But what I wanted to do was kind of just like um, make it as, make it not that, make it look like I have more <laughs> coming up um, than it just like hanging my bishop. So she checked naturally. And here she actually didn't take, which is what I was going for. Cause this, at this point, like I was just trying to um, psycho psychologically just, I like to play like kind of mind games, but they don't always work. But sometimes I like, guess game, it actually helped. So, cause this threat, if she took on here, it looks like I have this, oops, not here. I have this threat of 93 check. Because you can't, because if you take, I have rook a2 check. And maybe this is what she was worried about. But really, after king f3, it turns out that the white king is extremely safe on f3. I don't have any more checks. And then white shows up by two bishops. Um, I also have rook a2, but really none of these work. So I'm not sure why I exactly didn't take on c8. But I think it's because I really confidently played f6, g6. And it just complicates the position. 
So after rook a2, you can just play, what is it, like rook f1 or something? Or she can? Um, yeah, rook f1. I think you can just also check and bring the queen in. Mm. But yeah, it's just, it looks kind of scary, but there's really nothing there. And if, and if rook f7, is there anything in that line or? Rook f7, I think you can just play something like bishop f3 or um, queen f5. Yeah, maybe you can just maybe. play um, rook f1 here. Yeah, maybe just keep it rook f1, keep it simple. But this is kind of what I was going for. It, it looks like it's complicated. And so if she has no need to take on c8. Yeah. Which is, which is how I, was, I wanted her to feel. Um, but in reality, it's just kind of an empty threat. But so she wanted to um, prevent this thing on that too. So she actually played bishop b1, which obviously uh, stops rook a2. So now I just have, um, I'm still in a pretty bad position. This bishop on c8 isn't going anywhere. Um, all of my pieces are stuck. But I still wanted to try my idea of just keep on attacking. It's just trying to provoke a mistake. So I played queen d2, so she couldn't take the bishop now, and then I'm attacking f2. And now she played rook h4, which is kind of just like a, um, which is also kind of a move just because she's like worried about my threats. So she's just like tr trying to, uh, stop, not take on it, trying to um, push my pieces back. Like I think here the best move is actually king f3 or king, queen f3. And there, I don't really have any threats. I mean, it looks kind of scary, but nothing really works. Take on f2, take on g4, or queen f3, just simply coming back. And I still have a really bad position, and I think she's up by a pawn, right? Or no, it's it's equal material, but I'm going to lose a pawn soon. Um, but here she played rook h4, and all of a sudden, I have all sorts of ideas. Um, I played, so like, queen d5 check forces the queen to come back, because otherwise, um, I believe... Is it just, I have, okay, I think because you can't play king g1 because rook. a1? Well, no. I, thought I, had a, I thought I had a win here <laughs> if you play king g1. Um, Queen d1 check or something. And then you th you have win after king g1? Hmm. Yeah, I think so, if I remember right. Maybe no, it's maybe queen I d1 just queen and d1. queen. Yeah. I can't yeah. even go queen d5 again, just to repeat. I yeah, mean, if pretty, you do. Yeah. It's a pretty good, I'm pretty happy with this, considering I was just completely lost a few, yeah. a few moves before. Totally. And then, so queen f3 was kind of forced, and then now rook f7, which is this nice um, in-between move, so uh, she can't, so, so she can't get the king out. And now the there's actually a little tactic here that she could have done as an in-between move. I kind of showed it, but um, here White has, she had this nice in-between move. Bishop takes g6, because, and now she gets an extra pawn before we do the queen trick. But um, I guess she missed this, because I think she was starting to get low on time now, because in the last few moves. So she took on d5, and now when I take here, all of my pieces are out suddenly. Hmm. And now it's like a completely different game. Um, I was pretty happy in this position because I think I almost completely equalized, but I, we can go on and look at a few more moves, but basically, um, actually at this point, I think I was winning this end game if I play this correct, because um, there's this idea of rook a7, and you can't really defend this b3 pawn, because in the future, if there's like bishop c2, there's always rook a2. Um, I played here, and then there was a little bit of complications. F5, she played this right. Um, bishop f5, bishop f5. And here I played rook f7, but the best move was g takes f5. And the reason is because after rook takes h5, there's a little, I guess there's a little tactic here, but it's just, um, you can go king g6 and rook a2. And mm. th there's, rook, there's really no way to stop mate. You just have to go rook g8 and then sack the rook, which is not which shouldn't be holdable. So this should That's be amazing. amazing. Yeah, so we were getting a lot at this point, so I missed this, but um, what happened is uh, we got kind of into a strong position, but she wasn't allowed to draw because of the match situation. So I actually ended up winning this because she pushed a little too hard. This with this knight of two move, and now there isn't really anywhere the king can go because king of six is coming, and then rook d3, knight g4, and it ended up being 
a res resignation here because you can't stop work day three. Wow, what a nice, <laughs> what a nice example. I love this example. Yeah, it's a little bit unconventional example because it was kind of a, it looks like it was just like a few blunders on both sides. But um, what I think is really important to note that you, you need to recognize when your opponent is um, willing to take risk and and just wanting to win a, win a game easily. So like she's been winning the entire game basically because she completely outplayed me and I've been very passive. So here I just wanted to kind of retaliate and see what her response would be. So I did get lucky with these moves. But after a while, like when you, um, a lot of players, after they make one mistake, it's really easy to suddenly just make one mistake after another. I've done that so many times. I also have an example where I just lost a completely winning game as well, just because my opponent started playing these kind of tricky moves. So I think it's just really important to um, uh, try to provoke your opponent into making mistakes. I love it. I mean, just not giving up. And we've seen that from you so many times in the U.S. Championship. By the way, uh, Bachi Mag, uh, I believe she, she's from the Mongolian team, but she lived in the United States for a little while. Did you, if you tried to speak with her after the game, you probably saw she was fluent in English. Um, I think she lived in San Francisco for, for many years. Oh, oh, I don't, I didn't know that. I think so. I, I mean, I believe this is the same one. Um, I'm going to have to look it up afterwards, but yeah, she... She uh, lived in San Fran and now I think moved back to Mongolia a few years ago. Um, anyway, great example. I think this, would, this is going to be really good. Um, is, I think we might have time for like one more thing. So um, in this position, I think this is a really famous position. Oh, this is actually from a US Championship. I didn't notice that, but um, from a while back. So in this position, Black is just completely winning. Uh, I mean, Black is just up by a piece and it looks like Black is about to checkmate soon. But why I actually set up a kind of a little trick here. So here, Black played like the most obvious move in the position because what it went was it was like rookie two check, king h1, and now queen takes g3. And it's not so, and it looks like white is just completely lost here. But like the theme of today goes, you're never losing until the game is over. So here, white has a little tactic to come, try to save the game. So, um, the winning idea is actually this really nice stalemate idea because what you want to notice is that even though Black's since Black's position is so dominant, White has all of these pieces and pawns, they don't have anywhere to go. So the only things that can move are the rook and the queen right now. So you want to find a way to somehow get rid of the rook and queen and force Black to take them. And that's by queen g8. Because now Black has to take king takes g8 and after rook takes g7, um, no matter how you capture it, it's just completely, it was just a stalemate. And if black tries to run, like king f8, you can just follow the rook, rook f7, rook e7. Um, it's really important to make sure that you don't go somewhere like rook g7 first, because then black can do queen f7, and then if it's like... Queen g7, yeah. Well, actually, in that case, queen, I think you can... Queen g8, queen g6, can, king g6, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, so the king can run. Think so, and yeah. yeah, and then like anything else, Queen H just even ideas like this. So it's really yeah. important to be careful about that. Nice, nice one, and that's like a, a good example of move order too. So I like that. Mm -hmm. And you know the great thing about this position, Jen, is that um, I don't think I have uh, seen too many games from this U.S. Chess Championship that weren't by one particular player who scored <laughs> eleven out of eleven in this championship. <laughs> This was the 1963-64 the U.S. Championship was the one where Bobby Fischer went 11-0, which has like still lingering effects in the culture of U.S. chess because we have this special prize at the U.S. Championship and U.S. Women's Championship that if you win all your games, you get the Fischer Prize and get an extra $64,000. Now, the year that you won the U.S. Women's Championship, you were pretty close to that, weren't you? What did you get? Well, uh, I got 10 10 out of 11. Yeah, but I think I drew one pretty early on, so it was like a... <laughs> it was only a sweat in retrospect, like <laughs> before the, before the, you, you drew in an early round, but yeah. Yeah, so um, I think I drew around five. Yeah, you drew around five and then you won your last, you won like a bunch of games in a row, including your final game against your friend, Carissa Yip. So yeah, that was, a, that was an incredible championship. Um, 
Of course, you uh, didn't get to defend your title in April as you would normally have done, but probably you'll get a chance to defend it in the coming months. And um, what are your thoughts on that? Are you excited? Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really curious on how, um, because I feel like there's going to be a lot of different strange changing like over the course of quarantine i feel like some people are going to put all their all into chess and you're going to see a huge boost in level and um also i'm really excited to just play over the board chess again well yeah thanks jen so much for showing these examples any final tips for people on you know how to kind of keep with the fight keep fighting even when you're in a bad game uh it's a really cliche thing when people are like never give up but I think if you look at these kind of examples, it really shows that in a huge, huge, um, like a surprisingly portion of game, number of games, there's always this kind of like switch in the end where either one player kind of loses the momentum or just, just like a swindle or something that completely shifts the result. And it really sucks if you're the person that's winning and pushing. But um, if you're the one that's kind of low, like uh, that's that's losing or just in a bad position, you don't have anything to lose. So you just might as well try your best. Great. Love it. Thank you, Jen.